Well, welcome and thank you guys for joining. Um, I'm Kylie Goodkopf with Kirkwood Corporate Training. And as we have everyone um, continuing to join us this morning um, and our Facebook Live is up and running. So welcome Facebook. We're so glad to have you guys join us. For our Zoom users and for our Facebook Live viewers, if you could please go ahead and in that chat box or comment box, you could just tell us what common, excuse me, what common excuses you're hearing at work on why someone either um, isn't meeting deadlines or they're not wrapping up that big project, anything like that. Um, so today we have Pamela Mum with Harmonic Performance joining us to present on creating a culture of no excuses. Pamela is a best-selling author and a founding member of the John Maxwell training team. She is a nationally recognized teacher, speaker, and executive coach who earned, excuse me, who earned her uh, degree from Wartburg College and then went on to get her master's degree from the University of Iowa. Uh, Pamela's work is focused on developing people, aligning teams, and achieving remarkable results. One of Pamela's greatest rewards with being a trainer and an executive coach is watching teams and organizations elevate their performance to that next level and being fulfilled at work and creating a life um, that they love. So today's webinar is creating a culture of no excuses. We hear those familiar excuses, maybe we're guilty of saying them ourselves from time to time, of things like, I didn't have time, I didn't know, I was waiting to hear back from a colleague, a vendor, a client, um, I didn't know, or I didn't want to come off like a micromanager. Um, we've been there time and time again. And yet, when are we going to get it? I wish that they would just do their job. Everyday people find themselves face to face with issues that need to be addressed. Um, the question is, are they going to hide behind the excuses or are we going to help them show up and deal with the situation? Every time we indulge the excuse, we allow that person to become less efficient, less effective, less productive, and causing us to be a less than stellar team while they're being a less than stellar teammate and costing the company money. Harmonic performance is focused on creating a culture of accountability and allowing people and companies to rise and thrive. So just a quick reminder for our Zoom users, feel free to submit questions throughout today's presentation. Um, after we wrap up the formal presentation portion, uh, Pamela will stay on to do a live Q&A um, for our Facebook users, we are so grateful that you're here and we're glad that you could join us. Um, but in the future, if you would like to join us in that live Q&A, um, just go ahead and register via Zoom and that way you can participate in that. We will have a recording of today's webinar uh, available. It does take me a couple of days to do some light editing and add closed captioning and all of that good stuff. Um, but if you are a registered user, we will be um, emailing that out to you. And I will also post it to the Kirkwood Corporate Training Facebook page our LinkedIn page, and to our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And thank you, Pamela, for leading us through such an important topic this morning. Ah, thank you, Kay. This is going to be fun. I love this topic. So good morning, everybody. Welcome. What a fun thing to dive into right here at 9 a.m. So fun. So thank you, Kylie and Kirkwood, because you guys are doing a great job. You're a wonderful resource for your community, and I'm really excited to be partnering with you today. So harmonic performance is the art of creating a happy and unstoppable state of being in order to change the world. So this presentation is going to be from two perspectives, as an individual and then as a person who leads a team or a business. So we're going to touch on a lot of it, okay? Oops, let me get this going. I want to start with a question that says, have you ever, have you ever noticed how many times you are in situations where you did not choose the people that are around you? Think about all the times that people are around you and you did not choose them. Could be on the road. You did not choose the other drivers. Could be in a restaurant. You did not choose the other people that were going to be dining at that time could be in a grocery store. It could even be at your work. You know, maybe, maybe you interviewed a couple of people, but you probably did not choose everybody on your team. You didn't choose everybody that's in the organization. I mean, even look at your family. You probably didn't choose everybody that's in your family because maybe somebody married somebody that you didn't choose for them. So we are surrounded by situations where we do not choose the people who are near us. 
And one of the things that I hear all the time is this, focus on what you can control. How many of you have heard that? Focus on what you can control. To me, those words are as useless as keep your eye on the ball. If any of you have ever played sports, keep your eye on the ball. It's useless information because if I kept my eye on the ball, I'd have a black eye. So it makes no sense. In order to teach that skill, you would do something like, okay, I'm gonna throw the ball at you and I want you to swing over the ball. And then you would, you would throw that ball at different heights and you'd have them swing over. And then you'd throw the ball and say, I want you to swing under the ball. And they would start swinging under and you'd throw that at different heights. And then you'd mix it up. I want you to swing over, swing under, swing over. And this time I want you to hit the ball. So through that exercise, people learn what the words keep your eye on the ball mean. But I know that people don't understand, focus on what you can control because I see road rage and I hear people complain about people in their family. And I hear people get upset because there's a child crying at a table next to them in a restaurant. Or I hear people get frustrated because there's somebody in front of them at the grocery line using a check. Like who uses checks anymore, right? So if we really understood control what you can control, we would have a different experience of life. I like to tell people that in any situation, there is this line. And at any given moment, we either get to show up in this above the line harmonic state. This is where we are plugged into our best self. We are fully resourced. We are creative and energetic and we're vibrant and we're creative problem solvers and innovative. All those beautiful things that make life wonderful. Or we could show up in a below the line state, this primal state, fight, flight, or freeze. It's where we get a little bit aggressive and rammy. It's where we get snarky. We say things that later we regret saying. So in any given moment, we can be in that above the line state or below the line. And I'm gonna say that above the line is when we are, we're intelligent and it's a useful state of being. Below the line, not so intelligent. Like if I said to you, oh, in this moment, you're about to say something that you're gonna regret and you say it anyway. Doesn't that sound unintelligent? but darn it, we're going to fight for what we believe in. <laughs> so it's just so funny. And to me, it's not a judgment thing. It's a, this is how humans operate. Okay. So let's talk about what drama actually looks like when we're out in about and when we're working with teams. So this is both, right? Me as an individual, how do I show up? Me working with someone else, how do I show up? Maybe me observing somebody else and going, ah, that's how they're showing up. So we're gonna start with excuses. We hear all those things. I didn't have time. Nobody told me. I, I've been working on it and technology went down. I'm waiting for somebody else to get something to me. Excuses. We start finger pointing. Well, if little, little Johnny over there, I'll say Johnny, I'm sorry about that just the first name that came to mind. If John or Johnny would do what he's supposed to do, then I could do my part. If, if the company would provide me with the right resources, then I could do my part. If we had better technology, I could do my part. If we had better training, because you know the HR department, they're just not doing their job. So we start finger pointing. We start blaming everybody around us. It's never our fault. Our, Art. Who says that on a month at 9 a.m.? Sorry, it's, it's never our part. Um, cynicism, right? We just get so bogged down and negative. And we know these people, when they start moving toward us, we're like, uh, please don't look in my direction. And we start looking away because we just don't want to invite it into our life. We start hearing the justifying. Here's why I'm doing it that way. We start hearing the, the explanations, the education. Sometimes when I work with clients, I'll ask them what's going on there and they go into education mode. Well, education in one instance can be very you know, productive, 
But when you're using education and you're hiding behind it to justify why you're not moving forward, to explain why you're not moving forward. And that's where we hear a lot of the thinking around, well, this is how we've always done it. It's just a below the line state that leaves us in an unproductive state of being. Criticism. This shows up as gossip and sarcasm. It shows up as burnout, stress, overwhelm, and then frustration. So we know when we are in this state of being, we are not at our best, right? Even when people walk up to us and say, you know, when you're not at your best, you're still better than 90% of the people on the team. Well, that's, I mean, it's kind, right? Like they're trying to be helpful, but it's not very useful because what they're doing is saying, I agree, it's okay for you to remain frustrated. It's okay for you to remain less than what you're capable of. And that in itself is a useless state of being. Okay, so these are just some of the ways that we show up. Sometimes we'll see our teammates show up that way and we'll start participating in the gossip because we go, oh, I agree. If, if they over there would take care of something, then we could do our job better. And now all we have is a group of people below the line in that useless, unintelligent, fight, flight, or freeze state. So I wanna to talk to you just a second about what is the cost of that? The average salary, is, we're gonna take the average salary divided by 52 because it's 52 weeks, divided by 40 because average we work 40 hours a week, divided by how much um, we have, or which equals the amount that we pay per hour, right? So salary, how, we're just uh, doing the calculations to find out what do we pay per hour? So if somebody makes a salary of $50,000, then it'd be $962, which equals $24 an hour. Now you can do this for yourself. You can do this for the people on your team. You can do this for the organization. What do you pay each person per hour? And then we take how many people do we have on our team? So we take the number of hours. Oh, sorry. Most people on an average are in that below the line state, a minimum or an average of 2.5 hours a day. Now, when I ask people this, sometimes people will say, oh, I'm really only in that state 30 minutes until we start really talking about it. And then people will say, well, I'm actually half of my day, like four to five hours a day. Every time somebody interrupts me, I go below the line. Every time I need a piece of information and I don't have it, I go below the line. Every time I present an idea and nobody wants to listen to it, I go below the line. Every time somebody asks me a question and I've had to explain it two or three times, I go below the line. So once we start really looking at how often are you below the line, that number tends to go up, but we're gonna say an average 2.5 hours per day. So. We're going to take the hour, the number, the dollar per hour times 2.5 hours a day times five days a week times 52 weeks to figure out how much we're losing per person. And then we're going to take that times the number of employees. So in this example, I'm going to use 24 hours because, aver you know, average $50,000, the 2.5 means that $60 a day times the week is $300 a week for the year, $15,600 per person making 50,000, which means that if you have a team of 20 people, that's $312,000 a year that's just being underutilized and we're in a useless state, which means that we're not as efficient, effective or productive. So if you pay more in your company or if you make more, then you might be more than 15,000. If you are spending more time than two hours, you're wasting more than 15,000. And if you have more people than 20, then it's more than 312,000. So sometimes I think we forget that there is a monetary um, connection to this below the line state. 
I want to touch just a moment on, let's say that you're listening it to this from your own point of view. If you're spending 20 hours a week below the line, imagine what happens when you get 20 hours back to be more useful. Imagine what happens to your career path when you become the person that is actually fully resourced, making decisions from an intelligent space rather than an unintelligent space from that from that fight, flight, freeze, from that I got to defend myself, from that I need to look good or be right. Imagine what happens to your career when you take care of that. Imagine what happens to your team when you begin to lead from a place of, I like you. I love answering questions. When I'm answering these questions, what isn't working? What do we need to do so that you understand it and you can now take ownership of that? Imagine how that opens up possibilities for you, for your team, for your company, for your family, for your community. Like this is one of the things that I am the most passionate about in my work, to build people who build, in this case, businesses, to build people who build communities, to build people who build families. That's how powerful you are in this world. You don't get to tap out and say, no, the world has done me wrong, so I don't have to do anything like this. I'm gonna choose to remain a victim. And I guess you can make that choice, but then you can't be mad when your life doesn't turn out the way you want it to turn out. You can't be mad when your team doesn't, ex to, doesn't execute the way that you want them to execute. And you can't be mad when your business isn't thriving and hitting those really incredible um, that, that impact that you want to have into the world. It all starts with us. Okay. So people will try to fix this issue with these things like strategy. And now all this list, I'm going to say, I love everything on this list. It's just that this is often not the thing that's broken. So we need strategy. We need that vision. We need to know where we're going. We need the we need the goals, we need that mission, and we need the values, we need all of that. But if that's not broken, then that can't be the solution. And yet people will say, well, we're just gonna lean into more strategy or we're gonna lean into more processes. Now I'm a huge fan in process. We need to know our processes that actually give us the results, our tested and proven processes. But if a process isn't broken, it's actually that the process is good. The human being executing the process isn't executing, then we don't need more process. We're hiding behind process. People try to, to fix it with tactics. We're gonna try this, this other thing. I've had people even say, we have a report that it's really good, but nobody's using it. So we're gonna get a different report. We're gonna, or instead of doing the report, now we're gonna just have a face-to-face -face conversation. And it's like, well, what they didn't say in the report, did they say it in a face-to-face -face conversation? No, they didn't. So the tactic of changing from writing it down to saying it out loud doesn't work. They're not saying because they don't have the skills. It's as useless as saying, keep your eye on the ball. They'll send people to conferences, right? If they could just get more education, then, then that will be it. And I know, I don't know about you, I guess, but for me, I'll go to a conference and I will be on fire when I come back. Like I just learned so much great information. And then I go to implement it and it's met with resistance. And so then over time, there might be some incremental change, but for the most part, just kind of go back to what we were doing before because the conference isn't gonna fix. It's gonna give great ideas and I'm a huge fan, but if we don't know how to implement and work together and change, we hear another one, Com or growth happens just outside your comfort zone. So we talk about that and then whenever we try to go into growth, we blow it up. We get a little bit nervous. We fall below the line. We start, we start resisting. We start saying, well, it may not work. And so little by little, we go right back to our comfort zone. It's as useless as keep your eye on the ball. 
People listen to podcasts. They'll um, start book clubs. They'll do team builders. And again, I am a huge fan of all of these things. But if we don't build the people that actually execute on these things, then we could bring in a million solutions and we're still not going to develop the human being. Do you follow that? Like, and this to me is just like a, yeah, but people go to conferences to develop. Yes, they do. And when they come back, do we have a culture that embraces it and allows us to just make those, like in, instead of an incremental, incremental change that we can just actually dig into it and then make those leaps in our business, okay? So again, love this list. It just isn't, I would say more than not, this is not what's broken, unless you don't have a strategy. And then I would say, go find a strategy. So anyway, um, this it's a great list. The stuff that we're talking about actually underpins all of this. It's foundational. And when people start to do what we're talking about, to learn the skills to be above the line, then it actually reinforces everything that's on this list. It, this list isn't gonna fix it. The above the line is gonna fix it, okay? So let's have some tips on creating a no excuses culture. The very first thing is that you have to become an expert at being you. There are people that are so darn successful and they're wonderful. And then all of a sudden they'll do something that just causes a ripple effect that now everybody has to deal with this dramatic wake, right? They'll throw a grenade in. Like maybe you're, you've already set your strategy. You already know what you're doing for your next 90 days. And people have their marching orders and they, they know what, what's expected out of them and they have their metrics and they're moving along and it's awesome. And then somebody throws this, this idea over the wall and it hits and everybody's like, oh no, they're my boss. And so now I have to change everything because my boss just told me to do something different. And the boss was just talking, unaware that their action just caused an incredible wave. And then they look around and go, well, why'd you change? Why did you stop doing that? Because you told me to. No, I didn't, I was just talking. We have to become an expert at ourselves. Our words matter, our actions matter. What we say to people matters and we have to be responsible for that. We don't get to just tap out and say, well, I didn't mean to cause any drama, right? When we talk to each other, we can't just tap out and say, sorry about that. So in order to do that, we increase awareness. Awareness is key. You have to know yourself. You have to know what is it that I'm thinking about that has me going into that unresourced, below the line, fight, flight, freeze state? What has me sitting in meetings with really good ideas and saying nothing? What has me listening to an idea and saying, yes, that would be great, and here's how we could go about it, instead of, what yes, instead of sitting there saying, oh, I just don't think that's going to work. I may have said that wrong, but you know what I'm saying. So we have to have the awareness around ourselves. What are we bringing to the table? Who's showing up? Am I showing up below the line and just being like the anchor to any progress? Am I the one showing up that's disrupting in a negative way, right? Because we do need to disrupt in that above the line, go somewhere. But a lot of times we disrupt just to be disrupting because we thrive in chaos, unproductive. Then we have to be able to increase our readiness. Once we become aware, we start becoming resourced and we then begin to prepare ourselves for a higher level of performance. And when we can do that, then we can start to lead our team. Often people will say, well, if my team would, which puts us in a victim space, if my team would do something, then we could elevate. Well, that's not leadership, that's victim. We have to increase our intelligent action. Any action that we take from a below the line space is not going to serve us. If I'm mad and I get into action, 
probably going to create a problem for somebody else or going to slow down progress. If I create a plan from overwhelm, I'm probably just going to create a plan that isn't going to work because I'm a victim. Any plan created from below the line space may work temporarily. It's not a long-term solution and it's not the best solution. So we have to start getting ourselves in that above the line state. So we create a plan from there and then we take intelligent action that leads us toward what we want to experience for ourselves, for everyone around us. The last one is accountability. Now, I hear things all the time like, we need to hold each other accountable. That is a lie. I'm gonna say it again. We need to hold each other accountable is a lie. It's useless language. Because unless you are going to physically go over and hold somebody, like hold them, and then push on their fingers to make them write a report, or you're gonna go and move their legs to get them to go do the work they need to do. Hold someone accountable is just a useless saying, or we need to hold each other accountable, anything like that, useless. In a culture of no excuses, you hold yourself accountable and they hold themselves accountable because now you're in a relationship of adult to adult. Because if I think for a moment that I'm gonna hold you accountable, it means that I know the answer and you don't. I am smart and you are not. I could do this and you can't. And we always were like, why do people get offense or defensive when I'm trying to hold them accountable? Well, could it be that that very thought makes us superior to someone else. And in that process, we trigger defensiveness and we make the job harder. We actually come at that conversation as a parent to a child. Now, if you're talking to a child, that's fine. But when we're talking to people at work, this is adult to adult. And what we have to do is teach people the skill of accountability, just like throw the ball, swing over, throw the ball, swing under. We have to teach the skill. And when we do that, now we have adult, 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 adult showing up with full ownership, full responsibility for their own actions. And now we can be creative, problem solved, there's trust, there's better communication, all these things start happening. I want to tell you about the Presto program. And this Presto program, it really is a program to help people learn the skill of 100% accountability. It's easy to follow. It is fast track results and it's it has some direct coaching in it. It can be delivered in a variety of ways. It can be online, it can be through Zoom, it can be, you know, half day workshops, whatever works for you and your company. But until we really teach people the skill of being accountable so they can be above the line so that they can show up in their zone of genius and contribute at their highest level, the other things just aren't gonna work. In this program, you're gonna have common language. I hear it all the time. People will come into meetings and go, oh wait, we just slipped below the line, let's restore. And then they can go on with their, with their problem solving. I have companies that will come back and they'll have their whole team go through the program. And they're like, man, things that we could not get through before, we were bogged down in excuses and justifying. Those things are gone. We are now having conversations, we're problem solving, we have creative solutions, we're, we're creating, we're innovating things that we didn't even know were right in front of us, we were just blind to it. So great things happen with common language. 100% accountability, adult to adult, no more parent-child relationships, no more babysitting, no more being the warden. It's like we expect people to be adults and we expect ourselves to be an adult. There's a lot more clarity and focus and then we're able to get to that, that problem solving that moves things forward. We have to have that skill. In business, we will always have problems. We have to have the skill to solve them so we can elevate. All right, so that's, a, that's an overview of this, 
oh, sorry, and cross-team collaboration, right? That there's no more silos. There's no more, we're a victim of them. There's no more, they're bad and we're good. It's the whole, we are in this, there's unity and we are pulling in the same direction. So next steps, if you are interested in learning more about this, if you are listening to those excuses going, yes, that is in my company. If you're listening to it going, yes, that's in my life. There are individual programs, there are team programs, there's organization programs. Contact Kirkwood. They're an amazing resource. And that way they can help coordinate all of this. It will be wonderful. Their email is there. Their phone number is there. I would love to work with you. My goal is to help people who work within organizations feel like they are, they are fully present and they're fulfilled and satisfied. They can contribute their gifts and go, yes, I love going to work. I love working with these people. I love working with this company. Right now, there's a big gig economy going on where people are leaving corporate America and, and just starting doing it on their own. And what I would like and what I hear all the time is because corporate culture is just not that friendly. It's not that uplifting. It doesn't actually, I don't feel fulfilled when I'm leaving work. I want everyone to say, I love working in this company. All right. So any questions? Kylie, what do you think? Back to you. Great. Thank you again so much, Pamela. That was a great presentation. And I want to thank all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, like Pamela mentioned, if you're interested in bringing uh, Pamela in-house on this topic or any other topic, feel free to give us a call at Corporate Training at 319-398-5623, or you can send us an email at training at kirkwood.edu. Um, I just want to remind everyone, um, when you have a chance to go to Kirkwood Corporate Training on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, um, please like, follow, and subscribe, and it'll help you stay up to date on any opportunities like this one today or any other future ones we have as well. Um, in the meantime, for our Zoom uh, attendees, please feel free to go ahead and type any questions you have about this topic, uh, maybe about how to implement it, or if there was something that was said that really resonated with you, and we will tackle those here in a moment. Um, in the meantime, for our Facebook Live viewers, thank you so much for joining us. I will be ending your live stream now. Um, and I just appreciate everyone joining us in whatever format worked for them today.